Well, I'm Pastor Rob, and it's a pleasure to share with you God's Word this morning. Uh, thanks, Rob, and worship team, sound team, and if you're here for Sunday school, uh, this has been a worshipful morning already, and I hope to continue in that. Friends, I have a question for you. Do you ever wish you could take something back or undo what's been done? I think we all do at times, maybe even this week or this morning. It's a reality all around us. On October 25th, 1964, in San Francisco, the Purple People Eaters, my beloved Minnesota Viking football team, was up against the 49ers. The weather was 55 degrees, sunny. The game was close. Both teams could use a win, and it's the fourth quarter, and the 49ers had possession. The quarterback throws the, the, the ball to Kilmer, a running back and future pro bowler, and he catches it. And he starts running and gets hit and fumbles the ball. Suddenly, Jim Marshall, a legendary Minnesota defensive end, runs and scoops it up. This 248-pound Marshall is known for his speed. Nothing could stop him, nothing. He raced 66 yards to the end zone and scored, and in victory, launches the ball into the stands. But something happened. The, the stands received that ball with cheers. They were going nuts. This is California, not Minnesota, remember? And the Viking fans were groaning. Why? Marshall ran the wrong way. And it went down in history as the worst play ever in NFL history. Uh, sadly, uh, nothing has changed that much for the Vikings. Um, do you wish you could take things back or undo what's been done? I bet Jim Marshall did when he went the wrong way. He couldn't take it back. He couldn't undo what was done. He had to live with himself and has had to live with himself for over 50 years being known as Wrong Way Marshall. Maybe you feel like that. You know, maybe you feel like life's gone the wrong direction far too long. You think of yourself in light of your mistakes. Today's a new day, and the Bible says that his mercy is new every morning. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm going to share with you something that radically changes how we look at our past, how we look at our present, and how we look at our future. Our hope is not in some philosophical argument or Far Eastern mantra propped up by some positive self-talk, self-speak from a bestseller. No, our hope is found in God's Word, in Himself, in His all-sufficient, perfect revelation, the Bible. We're going to continue our series in John. Remember, John is written by the Apostle John, who's a follower of Jesus. He's part of the inner ring surrounding Jesus. He's been there for three years in ministry with Jesus around 30 A.D. Jesus loves this guy. He's called the Beloved. Um, but first, when we meet John, he's a son of thunder, speaking probably to a temper. But God has a way of changing people, of transforming people and taking thunder and changing it to light. Quieting over time, darkness turns to love, love abides, and he becomes the second most prolific author in the New Testament. This is a biography that we're going to look at this morning, and he has a point for us. This big point, big idea we've talked about before, it's that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is why he writes this, is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The apostle writes that you believe. And we hear his first, one of his first arguments in chapter 1 from a primary source, John the Baptist. Chapter 1, verse 19. I, I'd like to invite Josh and Grace up here. They've agreed to read. And, and it, we have a tradition here at Sawyer to stand in honor of God's word. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to to bring them up as you stand up and uh, read John chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. We'll also have it projected on the screen behind me. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews had priests and the Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? <laughs> he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He said, I am not, Grace. <laughs> Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Always oh, saying that. Okay. So they said to him, who are you? And he didn't give an answer to go and send us. What do you say about him? 
about yourselves. He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, when they had been sent from the Pharisees, they asked him, Then why are you baptizing, if neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I have baptized with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might reveal, be, might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I said, the Spirit descend, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's pray. God, we ask that your word would be on display here in such a way that we would behold your glory and that we would be transformed for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 19 begins, and this is the testimony of John. Who is John? Who is this John? That is a good question. Inquiring minds want to know. The priests and Levites came, came as far from Jerusalem Asking this again and again and again, who, who is this John? And this guiding question is going to direct our time this morning. Another question we're going to try to answer is the bigger question of the whole biography here. Who is Jesus? But who is John? We know from other biographical sources that John grew up in the hill country of Judah, which is modern-day Israel. His dad was a Levite priest, Zechariah. And him and his wife were known for being righteous and blameless. Some estimate the total of these priests were 7,000 in the country of, a, of a, about 500 to 600,000 people. So that means that the Baptist was born into a small group of the religious elite of his day. We also know that the Baptist had some interesting personal habits. You may remember he, he wore camel, camel fur or camel hair uh, as clothing and he ate grasshoppers for food. He lived a strange outdoor lifestyle at the River Jordan, and I imagine he was a cross between a revivalist preacher and Daniel Boone's eating and dress habits and a, a charismatic, loud radio talk show personality he dropped into Warren Dunes State Park on a summer day. He was well known. Everyone was talking about him. Everyone who's anyone knew him. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 5, it says this, Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. He was on prime time. He's the entertainment of the day, the main attraction in the area. All the region, all the region is going out to him. Why? What is he about? That's what the leadership wanted to know. Who is he? And he is going to give us an answer. But he's going to change the question and pivot attention from himself to another. He drives the Apostle John's argument and directs them to Jesus. I don't think I've explained who these priests are. I think we have an understanding of these priests or about priests in general. They're teachers and religious leaders of the day. At the time, they're bivocational, so they work mostly manual labor jobs. The Levites were descendants of the peace, priests deposed in Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible. They are involved in temple music and various forms of service, sometimes servants and temple police, doorkeepers, and the like. In verse 24, we see the priests and Levites were sent by Pharisees. Who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees are religious leaders of the day with strong politi political power. They're great rule keepers, but they're also great hypocrites. They keep the rules when people are looking, and uh, many would oppose Jesus. But some wouldn't. And we'll find out more about that as we move through the book of John. But here we're concerned about John the Baptist, not Jesus. Why is he baptizing? He's not sanctioned by the priestly community to do this. It's the priest's job to teach and perform ritual cleansings and purification. They're the protectorate and overseers of the people. What is the son of a priest and Levite teaching all the countryside? 
A crowd's forming. People are talking. The leadership wants control. They want order. They want information. And they want it now. Some think the Baptist might be the Messiah. The Messiah or Christ was coming. The Bible talks a lot about the anointed one who would come in the end times, the last days. In Genesis, for example, God says to Adam and Eve, a descendant will come from them who will crush the head of a serpent in Genesis 3.15. You may remember that. The serpent introduced sin into the world, and one day that will be destroyed. Sin and this serpent. The Messiah is coming. In Samuel, the book of Samuel in the Bible, the prophet tells the king of Israel, David, that there will arise a new king, a son of God, who will reign forever over the nation after, after David, one of his descendants. A Messiah is coming. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Zechariah foresees for the people of Israel, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Messiah is coming. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. The Messiah is coming. These are only a small sample of what the Bible talks about happening when the Messiah comes. The climate is ripe with people claiming their Messiahs and revolutionaries calling to throw off the oppressive Roman occupation of God's great nation. A ruler, a king, a righting of all wrongs was at hand, and so people thought and dreamed and longed. And then they heard a voice crying in the wilderness, the voice of John the Baptist. Maybe he's the answer. Maybe he's the Messiah. Or maybe he's a crackpot needing to be silenced and stopped. The priests, the Levites, I imagine were like drones, spying out the Middle Eastern countryside for signs of the times either to exploit or to obliterate them. Who is this John the Baptist? Who is John the Baptist? And what did they find? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Messiah, guys? Is he? No, he's not the Messiah. In verse 20, he says, he confessed, they did not deny, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Well, the Jewish priests knew of another end times figure, Elijah. Maybe the Baptist was Elijah. In the last book of our Old Testament is a book called, small book called Malachi. In Malachi, in the last two verses, it says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Prophets... Prophets saw immorality and destruction of the values and belief systems that built their nation. Prophets saw people running after whatever their hearts desired. Prophets called people in the midst of this to repent and change and alter their family history. They, they pleaded with people to adjust their ways to God's ways. Prophets also predicted God would intervene and make adjustments one day. They taught that time is not cyclical, time is not a circle of life, but a linear movement towards a culmination of judgment and restoration. And so Malachi, in, in the voice of God, speaks and predicts Elijah will be sent to turn the hearts of God's people. And the religious know this. And they ask John, are, are you Elijah? Elijah, if you remember, was a prophet in his own day, and he didn't die. One of the two people in the Bible is recorded of not dying, but is transported to heaven. I mean, it's pretty amazing. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. I'm reminded of Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz, if you see that movie. Uh, she's transported to another world. But in heaven, there are no witches and flying monkeys. There's no empty hearts. Elijah's there, but he's not going to be there forever. Malachi says he's coming back. Malachi is coming back. And this isn't a claim of reincarnation where he's born into a new body. That's not what the, God is meaning here. But what does he mean? He's coming back. What does this mean? Well, if we look elsewhere in another biography of Jesus, we actually see one of the, a part of the answer in Luke. In Luke an angel of the Lord talks to John the Baptist's dad, and he says this. 
Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the power, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I'm sure that the Baptist heard this story from his parents growing up. You know, we want good things for our kids. And here God is saying, your son is going to be great. I don't think we'd hide that. Maybe we would because of pride for a while, but it, would, it came out. The apostles record it. And they heard this too. But years pass, decades pass, 30 years or so, and no Messiah, no answer to this prediction, the connection between John and Elijah. What's with that? Is he Elijah? Well, this is the same question that some apostles or disciples at the time asked Jesus. And Jesus has a response in three different places in the New Testament. And he actually says something very directly in Matthew 11, verse 14. In Matthew 11, verse 14, it says, He is Elijah who is to come. He is Elijah who is to come. Jesus and the angel of the Lord understood that John was acting in the power and the role of Elijah, preparing the way for God's one and only son. But when pressed... By the priests and Levites in chapter 1, what does he say? What does he say? No, I'm not, I'm not Elijah. That's not me. Now, maybe it's a technicality. He's, not, he's, not, he's saying I'm, I'm, it's not a reincarnation. Um, or it's, it reflects his doubts and confusion, his own confusion. We certainly see later. But he says no. That's what the text says. So the priests and Levites take another stab at who he might be, who this John the Baptist might be. Maybe he's the prophet mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 18. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, the fifth book of the Bible, Moses and God foretell, predict a prophet coming. It says this, Then the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It's to him you shall listen. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Is the Baptist... The prophet. Is he the prophet? No, that's right. He says, no, I'm not. In verse 21, verse 25. So that leaves the priests and Levites confused. And maybe that's the point all along. Maybe that's the Baptist point. He gives them something to think about. And he's going to give them something more to think about. So he, he quotes. He quotes this. I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. You want to know who I am? I'm the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. This is a direct citation from the prophet Isaiah some 500 years before. The investigators hearing this go back to trying to understand, what are you about? And so they ask, well, why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, if you're nor Elijah, nor the prophet? It's a good question. What is John doing baptizing people? Teachers in the day, actually, had people baptize themselves as a as an act of purification and initiation. Here John is embracing a new authority, transforming a tradition and convention. Um, he's baptizing people with authority. This Baptist, Baptist response, here's what's going on. I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Verse 26, 27, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. The Baptist seems to be pushing the priests, the Levites, the Pharisees that approach him. He's confronting them that their focus is all wrong. They don't know who he is, and they don't know who who is the one to come. And so in verse 27, he says this, Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He's saying, the the Baptist is saying, he can't even untie Jesus' shoe. He's saying, if you think that I'm important to come all this way out to hear me, you haven't seen anything yet. Remember, this is a society where it's not, there's no modern sanitation or transportation. There's no garbage trucks. There's no departments of health. 
The land was rough and you had to walk or ride an animal to get anywhere. And people wore sandals, not shoes. Your feet were open to the air and exposed to whatever was left on the ground. So it was customary to enter a home and take off your shoes. It was polite. And then slaves would wash your shoes. Your wash your feet, sorry. In this society, a student, a student of John the Baptist, a disciple, would take on the form of a slave. They would do whatever their teacher wants them to do, except one thing. They would not take off their teacher's shoes. Slaves would, not, would take off the shoes, not students. And the Baptist is saying he is less than a student of Jesus. He is less, actually he's less than a slave. The man everyone in the region is coming out to see is not worthy to take off the shoes of the one to come. G- John is shifting the focus onto the Messiah, and the priests and Levites are silent. The day is done, the court's adjourned, but the apostle's not finished. He brings the Baptist back the next day to the Jordan River, and now we see Jesus. The Baptist says in verse 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose... I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. The Baptist answers why he came. He came to reveal who Jesus is to the people. And we already know this from verses 6 through 8. John tells us in the prologue, There was a man sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. This chapter has two guiding questions. The first is, who is this John? And the second, and underlying through the whole book, is who is Jesus? We think we know who he is. I think we think we know who he is, but do we? Do we know Jesus? The Apostle Paul, writer most of the New Testament, makes his aim to know Christ. He says in Philippians chapter 3, I want to know Christ. The Apostle Paul actually saw him. He was there with the eyewitnesses. He was there in the, in the land of Israel. I mean, he was right there. You would think if anyone knows Jesus, the Apostle Paul knows Jesus. And his aim is to know Jesus. And he says all the other stuff in life are trash. I think learning about who Jesus is is not just for our nursery program. It's not just for academics in some libraries and colleges somewhere. It's for us today, and John contends, Jesus is our life. Jesus is our life, and abundant life comes from him. No matter where you're at in your journey of faith, I think we can all grow in our understanding of Jesus and who he is. I think there's a fog, though. For the people who were in John's day, is there a fog of unknowing for those who lived with him? They couldn't see the, the, exhaust, the inexhaustible, infinite nature of Jesus, that he's more than just a person. They were stuck in the fulfillment of the prophecies and the confusion of their own assumptions and expectations versus the reality of what God had planned. People had this expectation of political liberation wrapped up in the Messiah. The Old Testament talks about conquering, rescuing, saving, and ruling. And they had a history of that, where the most dramatic rescuing and saving was the, the Exodus, what we just talked about in our last big series, saving them from 400 years of slavery. This is what would come to the ancient mind when they're thinking of a Messiah. Israel experienced a zenith thousands of year, a thousand years before, but their ancient writings predicted that one day tables would turn and life would be different, and the glory of, people, of the people would come back. And here Jesus appears in the, on the scene, along with all those expectations. And the Baptist identifies him. Who is Jesus? He is the Messiah. Verse 20. He also says he is the Lord. He is the ruler, the king, the master. And in verse 27, he is worthy. Jesus is worthy. He pulls rank on John the Baptist in verse 30. We also find in verse 29 that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who is Jesus? Jesus, in verse 29, is is Jesus. 
If you remember, Jesus is Greek for the Hebrew name Joshua, which is the Lord is our salvation. The Lord is my salvation. Jesus represents the salvation of the people. Jesus is also before the Baptist in verse 30. That's interesting, because if you know your history, that John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. So how is Jesus before John the Baptist? John the Baptist is probably baptizing before Jesus. How is Jesus before John the Baptist? What is he saying there? I think he's pointing to the divine nature of Christ, the eternal nature of Christ. We don't exist before our birth. We are created. We are made. Jesus has always existed. He's begotten, not made. He's eternal. We also see that the, the Baptists tell us that Jesus is going to baptize, not just with water, but with the Holy Spirit. He has the power to, to, to dispense the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will remain on him, which is a, which is a fulfillment of Isaiah 11, verse 2. And we see here a Trinitarian reality written in the first chapters of John, where God the Father is speaking to John the Baptist, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove is resting upon Jesus. All three persons are there, and yet we maintain a mysterious reality of a, of a unified God, a monotheism with simultaneous distinction within the Godhead, an exquisite paradox of unity and diversity. Finally, the apostle moves to the whole point of the book. In verse 34, look at verse 34, the Baptist acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God. We could spend another week just on that, that Jesus is the Son of God. And certainly we're going to hit that again because that's the point of John writing this book. But let's back up to what the Baptist says in verse 29. What is this Baptist getting at when he says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Lambs are more than just cuddly farm animals. They're significant in the history and worship of the Israelite people. You may remember that Abraham took his son Isaac, his only son Isaac, up to Mount Moriah. Isaac asked them, they're gonna, they have wood and fire, they're going to have a sacrifice. Isaac asks his dad, where's the lamb, where's the, where's the sacrifice? And his response is, God will provide. And God provides a lamb. Lambs are significant in the history of Israel. Israel, remember, was in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. And the final plague, in the final plague, lambs were slaughtered in every home, and the blood was put over the doorposts before the angel of death came over Egypt and passed over the people of Israel. And their last plague before they were free from their slavery. Lambs were significant in the history of Israel and were sacrificed regularly for sin, known and unknown, unknown, for breaking God's commands, satisfying God's right anger. And the author of Hebrews in the New Testament looks back on the Old Testament and explains it in this way in chapter 9, verse 22. He says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is who Isaiah would say, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, and like sheep that's before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus takes away the sin of the world. So what does that mean? What does that mean, kids? Is, is there no more sin? Is sin all gone? That's not his point. Sin, sin would be, that would be proved wrong in a second. Sin remains in, in our world today. And it would, have, it would have been written probably different. Like, he has taken away the sin of all the world. There's no more sin. But what is he teaching here? He takes away the sin of the world. 
How does he take away the sin of the world? Is the whole world forgiven then? Does it, does it really matter about sin anymore? Is all, everyone forgiven? Why does he include the word world? What is John getting at? And if we believe in divine justice, and we do, how does this work? If he takes away the sin of the world, does Jesus pay for part of it and we pay for part of it? Or Jesus pays for part of it and then we have to pay for it again? Is God unjust? Is Jesus' Jesus' work not good enough or God a liar? No, absolutely not. What does he mean here that Jesus takes the sin of the world, takes away the sin of the world? I think it's important that we look at the context. How is he using these words? The word world used in John's writings 105 times and actually fairly close to here in John chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles and are looking along with me, jump to chapter 3. We'll have the words behind me as well. Chapter 3, verse 16. It's very familiar. Chapter 3, verse 16. And I, I bolded the words here. World. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. We see here that Jesus teaches that God loves the world. We see also that saving is conditional upon believing. We see also that this belief is in God's Son. I think the point, the relevant point here, is the word might. Might is key. The Lamb has the power to take away all the sin of all the world. His work on the cross is the potential to pay for every single sin that is, that was, and is, and ever is to come. And the testimony of Scripture, and even Jesus himself in this text, is that the world will not receive this blessing. But the power of the cross is that it could. It has enough to handle it. Another way to put it is the gospel invitation is open to all, but the gospel effect is only for those who believe. The good news is for you who believe that your sins are taken care of at the cross. So John says, as Jesus approaches, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So who is Jesus? He's the sin bearer. We need Jesus to take our sin, and not just the consequences of those painful, hurtful consequences, but we need the sin taken care of, gone, for us to enjoy God's presence forever. God is perfect, and the consequence of sin is death and judgment and punishment and separation from the holy God. Jesus endures all that for you and I. He takes away the sin of the world. Otherwise, there'd be no reason for him to be coming. So if we're honest, and this morning I think we all fall short of our resolutions, let alone God's demands. We soon neglect our New Year's motivation. We come up short. We have to deal with guilt and frustration. Have you ever had guilt? Have you ever felt that, that tinge of guilt? Maybe you're a kid who struggles with anger, and you blow up one more time, one more time. You can't stop that, and you feel guilty over your anger and lack of self-control. Maybe you're a parent, and you're so fearful, you can't let things go. You know you need to relax and trust God, but it, it's impossible. And anxiety seems to suffocate you with sleepless nights. And the guilt and the powerlessness nag at you. Maybe you're a dad, and you struggle with being honest. Everything's a lie or sham or half-truth. To tell the truth would expose who you really are. Would you survive? What would survive? What would people think? And guilt remains and powerlessness. Maybe you struggle with addiction to narcotics or chemicals of some sort and you cannot stop. Whatever you struggle with, you and I are left in our struggles with shame and guilt and regret. Whether you're hungover or fooling around or just seeking out and not finding satisfaction, the reality is you cannot you can never take something back. You cannot undo what's been dumb, done. You know, Jim Marshall, that legendary football player, could never rewind the tape and edit out what those films recorded that day. It's still there on YouTube. He couldn't scrub the articles and stories that would be told. He couldn't wipe the clean the memories of all who got 
a laugh at his expense. And it's just a mistake. No one's hurt. Sin hurts. Sin divides. Sin separates. It destroys. It's like sweet poison that tastes good and then kills. Sin has consequences, and justice demands payment. We have two payment plans. We can pay for it ourselves forever in judgment and anguish, or we can behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God can take it away. He can remove our sin, and he offers himself for yourself today. Today is a day of mercy and grace for all who believe. That's how we handle our past. That's how we handle our present. And that's how we can handle our future. Can I get an amen? Now, some of you know this and need to remember that you're forgiven in Christ. His mercy is new this morning. There's no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. You are born in him, alive in him, and your sin is taken. Behold the Lamb of God this morning. Now, some of you don't care. You're just waiting for this to be over. <laughs> Why is that? Why did you care? Do you believe? Do you really believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Look intently at the reality that is before you. Don't be satisfied with nominality and mediocrity. Strive for eternity. See the Savior. Praise Him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Some of you don't care because you don't believe. You doubt. You hear this story, and maybe you haven't heard it before. Let me use another analogy of the football game. We're all players. Naturally, all of us have been running the wrong direction. It's the last moments of the fourth quarter, and we think we're running towards victory. There it is. There's the end zone. There's our goal. Happiness, joy, you know, stuff, relationships, things. But if we're not running after God, we're running after ourselves, and our way ultimately leads to hell itself. In this last-ditch effort that we exert in this moments of life that we have, the Holy Spirit's calling you to turn around. Some of you, he's calling you to turn around and see the scoreboard. Jesus has won the game. For those of you who are on his side, who believe in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, you just need to turn around. You just need to say, sorry, sorry, sorry for going this way. Thank you for dying on the cross. Forgive me. Please forgive me for what I've done. Sorry, Thank you, and please. The Baptist knew his purpose. He speaks that all might believe through him, and I believe that God has you here for a purpose. Maybe, maybe it's clear, maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe this is new information, maybe it's old. You know, while Jim Marshall was running, his heart out, the crowd's screaming, the announcers are yelling, and the Minnesota fans are shouting back at their black and white RCA TVs and the Zenith radios, turn around! One report of the event said that many Minnesota players were running down the sideline begging for Marshall to turn around. Ron Vander Kellen, a, a backup quarterback, he said this, I, I was like everybody else on the sideline. We were yelling, you're going the wrong way! You're going the wrong way! And I see John the Baptist like that, telling people, repent, turn around. You're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. It's not a matter of a game. This isn't a touchback. This is eternity. And if you truly believe this, you should remember that Christ's mercy on your life. And don't keep it to yourself this year. What can we do this year as a body of believers, as a community, to share this with others this week? Who might God bring in your path that you could share this with? I was talking to Eric today. You know, one of the things we have a decade-old tra tradition of fun fair, totally fun, totally free. We invite the community in just to have fun. And we build relationships with people. And people get to church. And we hope that they can hear the gospel. Maybe, maybe, maybe God will bring a neighbor in your, in your life that you can invite to church to hear the gospel. Maybe you could study the Bible with them and hear, hear the gospel, this wonderful news. Maybe you could just pray for somebody. Someone shares their heart, and you say, you know what, I'll pray for you. And maybe those, those little seeds that you're planting will help them behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That fun fair plug, we need, by the way, we need someone, if someone wants to help, help spear that, or head that up, that'd be great. Um, C.S. Lewis, the author of Chronicles of Narnia, wrote a story called Prince Caspian. 
In it, Lucy, one of the main characters, had seen the Christ-like figure Aslan and tried to persuade those with her to follow him. But they waffle. They waver. They doubt what she says. And the group says, you know what, let's take a vote. Let's see what, let's see what we should do. We'll take a vote that's democratic. And it goes the other way. So they don't follow her, her lead. And she goes with the flow. She's, I'll just go with the flow. She doesn't break off and follow Aslan. But later she leaves the group and follows him. And here's her interaction. Lucy, Aslan says, much time has been lost today. Yes, wasn't it a shame, said Lucy. I, I saw you all right, and they wouldn't believe me. They're all so... And from somewhere deep inside Aslan's body, there came the faintest suggestion of a growl. I'm sorry, said Lucy, who understood some of his moods. <laughs> I didn't mean to slang the others, but it wasn't my fault. Anyway, was it? And the lion stood, looking straight at her eyes. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy, you don't mean it was. How could I? I couldn't have left the others. Come up to you alone? How could I? Don't look at me like that. I suppose I could. Yes, I, I wouldn't have been alone. I know not if I was with you. But what would have been the good? Aslan said nothing. You mean, said Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right somehow? But how? Please, Aslan, am I not to know? To know what would have been, my child, said Aslan. No, nobody has ever told that. Oh, dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan, if you go back to the others now. Wake them up and tell them you've seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me. What will happen? There's only one way to find out. My good friends, don't do nothing. Care, care about him and care about those you care about. Wake them up and tell them who you've seen. And behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray. God, it's so scary sometimes to go on our own, to follow you. We're all at different points in life, and uh, sometimes we just don't even know. But you've promised to be with us, to guide us, to lead us, and to help us. We ask that in 2016, in the end of January, and in this day, you get great glory, and that we would behold you who has taken away our sin. In Jesus' name.